It's a great pleasure to be here, friends, members of the Foresight community. Uh, I spoke at this event in 2015, it seems like a, a long time ago now. The Islamic State ISIS was reaching at that time its apogee, and this looked like a, a reality that we'll have to deal with for the uh, foreseeable future. Uh, I, I do not want to cover the same ground. I, I do want to revisit, revisit some of these themes since then in the light of taking stock of what's happened, what's changed, what, ha what hasn't changed, and what this means for the, the future. Uh, I'll cover three main points, and I should say I need your undivided post-lunch attention because I only have one slide, and I'm going to keep you on tenterhooks. That, that's right at the end of the presentation. Three points. Uh, firstly and briefly, failures of foresight and intelligence with relation to how terrorism and particularly our understandings of radicalization are changing and developing. Uh, I'm going to cover these in both the, the macro and also the micro level at the level of the individual. The kinds of work we need to be doing moving forward, my second point. And finally, some of the futures that uh, I think we're going to be, to be faced with. I'll begin with President Obama's uh, speech at the National Defense University. This is May uh, 2013, 23rd May 2013, and I quote, Today, the core of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan is on the path to defeat. Their remaining operatives spend more time thinking about their own safety than plotting against us. So that's the current threat. Lethal, that yes, capable Al-Qaeda affiliates, threats to diplomatic facilities and businessmen abroad, homegrown extremists. This is the future of, of terrorism. We have to take these threats seriously and do all that we can to confront them. But as we shape our response, we have to recognize that the scale of this threat closely resembles the type of attacks we faced before 9-11." End quote. So Obama and his advisors clearly got it wrong. When the histories of this period are eventually written, it would be very tempting to take this as a, as a seminal moment, a moment of intelligence failure. It's easy now, of course, with the passage of time, to make these sorts of assessments. With Islamic State, a, a re reconstruction of the years 2013-2014 suggests, in fact, a, a number of pivotal moments when both the White House and the intelligence community misjudged Islamic State. As many of you know, by 2013, classified, white, classified intelligence estimates painted a grim picture of the growing threat from Sunni extremists in Syria. But the reports generated little attention in the White House, and this was a White House consumed by firefighting and a reluctance to be drawn back into the same uh, issues in, in, in Iraq. So these are not simply intelligence failures, nor failures of foresight, I would argue. This is also a type of cognitive failure, a shared mental model of how the world works, or in this case, a model of how Iraq would work after the withdrawal. And all these factors came into play to allow the organization that we now call Islamic State to achieve a measure of strategic surprise when it rolled into Iraq. I could give you plenty more examples of this, but just one out of many. This is the National Intelligence Council, the US NIC Global Trends 2015 report. 2015, but the report is actually uh, written and comes out December 2000, December 2000, and this is less than a year, of course, before 9-11. And I quote, most anti-US terrorism will be based on perceived ethnic, religious, or cultural grievances. Terrorist groups will continue to find ways to attack US military and diplomatic facilities abroad end quote, emphasis on, on abroad. It's easy now, of course, with the passage of time to make these uh, assessments. With Islamic State, <clears throat> many, of you, many of you now know that the problem was actually, uh, rather, what I'm trying to do is not a, a, a US bashing session. I would argue all around that even at the meso level, there, there, there have been failures. Look at, for example, what's happened in the southern Philippines, in Marawi. This is an intelligence failure to predict the elements sympathetic to Islamic State would attempt to take and hold a city. And this is the first time th that this has ever been attempted by elements linked to or sympathetic to ISIS outside of Syria or Iraq, and no one saw this coming. So what I'm trying to do is to make an observation about terror, extremism, and, and complexity. The literature on intelligence warning of this type is gripped with an obsession with failure, a post 9-11 obsession with failure. Uh, in particular, we want to avoid any kind of event, not just like 9-11, like 7-7, and this is what some have called in the business a type of, of failure complex. I would argue that those in the foresight business should be very wary about this. Now, it's certainly very legitimate to want to avoid another 9-11, uh, 
But in some theatres, we are so obsessed about this that we did not anticipate how terrorism would morph. It's very difficult when one is gripped by this kind of anxiety to advance the conversation towards building better security systems. Is there something, uh, here I'm coming to my second point, is there something in particular about terrorism and extremism and the actions of non-state actors, which admittedly have evolutions and behaviours which are, are very hard, difficult to predict, is there something which by nature is especially invulnerable to the type of foresight tools that we have before us? Here I must confess a, a sudden puzzlement. The foresight practitioners in, in many countries address very, very complex sociopolitical, even technological scenarios far better than they do extremism and terror. My belief in the field of terrorism radicalization is that we are still looking at too many high impact events and big ticket attacks. Now, don't get me wrong, such attacks will still occur and they will certainly leave a, a lasting mark. And of course, security authorities will want to do their, their utmost to secure their, their sovereign territory. My meaning here is a little different. On the part of the analyst, there's this phenomenon, uh, which I alluded to briefly in 2015, this phenomenon called deep regret. The regret over very big losses and the desire to avoid them. This still hasn't left us, even though with the passage of time since the last two years, there's been a dispersal of lone wolf attacks and amateur attacks um, and small group attacks. There are still some signs, in my view, of security thinking uh, not having changed, not having left us altogether. Two implications from this. First, to a certain extent, I think this throws off a general capacity for accurate future and forward-facing work in the terrorism field. Analysts and, and uh, intelligence analysts, think tank people, are seldom given credit for postulating continuity. And in my view, what you're going to get with Islamic State, at least over the medium term, is in fact a form of continuity. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about the continuity in terms of Islamic State's legacy, the IS brand, the digital afterlife, the online presence. Secondly, we, and here I'm talking about think tank communities, are not thinking clearly enough, nor straight enough about Islamic State and its potential evolutions. We are still talking and thinking far too much about eradication. What's happened recently with IS in its reverses in Mosul and Raqqa, this has encouraged this kind of thinking. Certainly, kinetic approaches will certainly see successes from time to time, but what I want to do here is to talk about the bigger picture. And for this, I think we need to go down to the micro level, the, the dynamics of individual radicalization, where I'm not sure we're, we're much better than at the macro uh, level. In terms of having a proper understanding of the radicalization and de-radicalization processes, we are seriously in danger of falling behind the curve. Some of the radicalization scholarship over the last few years has been precisely about this. How come more than 15 years after 9-11, we are no closer really to understanding what radicalizes people. We know some of the story, we don't know the whole. And some of the foremost experts in the field, and these include Mark Sageman uh, and others, have started to point this out. Is it poverty? Is it social alienation? We, we don't know. What model works? Is it the NYPD stepladder model of radicalization or the five floor staircase model or some sort of cognitive trigger as suggested by, by Viktorowicz or others? We, we don't know. Or is it the individual being exposed to some sort of media propaganda, indoctrination, sometimes online, sometimes a combination on, offline? The simple fact is we have so many theories and we have no one answer. So I want to move on to my, my next point and it's become almost a, a cliche to say this. We need multidisciplinary approaches. People who are not traditionally terror experts need to come into the game. Thinking about terrorism and radicalization over the long term requires a different skill set compared to those who are required to deal with immediate crisis. These are people who are not looking for the next black swans, although the accretion of knowledge may sometimes point to such a possibility. Secondly, for foresight generally, a lot has been said about the wisdom of crowds. For terror, I would argue that what we need is the wisdom of select crowds, and this is an issue I'll come to. My argument is that what should make up the right crowd would not necessarily be immediately intuitive. Sure, we need more generalists, people who are comfortable in multiple disciplines, but we also need specialists to integrate ideas of complexity uh, in terms of what we think about extremism. I've argued it this elsewhere, but particularly in the social media and extremism stakes, what you need is branding, advertising, psychologists, experts, and even people who deal with juvenile delinquents. 
Very few communities of practice have formed or have formed over the past couple of years since I've last spoken on this issue. In Singapore, I would say, some of these unofficial communities of practice are beginning to, to come together so that there is some progress. And within this context, I would venture to say that it is not a series of communities that, committees that we need. We need more in this regard in terms of using collaborative foresight and collaboration. This is one thing which really puzzles me. There is no current ongoing horizon scanning work which links the international security communities and here I'm not referring to intelligence sharing, which is, which is different and which should take place. I'm talking about combating IS social media messaging and even for de-radicalization, we need to ask and to find out what works, what doesn't work, what works but is context or cultural specific, cannot be transplanted. My point is that think tanks engaged in the security business and extremism in particular do not talk to each other enough, whereas we should be playing a critical role in making informed suggestions about how the evolution of the extremism landscape is going to happen. So bottom line, we still don't know what really radicalizes people. And bottom line, we still have too many ideas in terms of counter narratives, counter messaging. And this mistakes, I think, uh, the point when it comes to, important, comes to important complexities in terms of how you combat Islamic State and jihadist uh, messaging, which is extremely persuasive. And those of you who are familiar with the issues will only need to look to what happened with the US uh, State Department Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications uh, is now called the Global Engagement Center. And what, what that example showed is that IS messaging has actually been able to out-evolve everything thrown at it, particularly state counter-narratives. And understanding that maybe is something we can talk about later in the, in the Q&A, because understanding the virtual legacy of IS is going to be very important. It's going to be at least as potent as the physical uh, legacy. What I've put forward over the last few minutes, it's not meant to be an antidote or panacea, but I think it would, if applied, help us see slightly further in terms of what's going to come next for extremism and radicalization. If not, the security services in 10 years' time are going to be dealing with, who knows, five, tenfold increase in the number of phone numbers, names, faces, dates, places that they deal with right now. The academics are still going to be bemoaning that, we, as we are now, the stagnation of research into radicalization and in 10 years' time, we still won't know what we don't know now. In my center, I often get asked by policymakers, what makes a terrorist, what is the terrorist type? And when I'm asked this, I, I answer as honestly as I can. The pattern is that there is no pattern. Almost all the officials I, I have spoken to, is particularly in Europe, uh, where I've just returned from, are actually moving beyond the, the trope or the motif of people from depressed socioeconomic backgrounds in France from the banlieue, uh, of course, we have these people, but we've also seen clean skins, some perhaps with a certain psychological vulnerability, a certain yearning or need for something better. Yes, we have those. We also have people who are completely normal, completely normal like you and I. Many, in the, many are not religious, some are not even Muslim to begin with. Uh, a French security official described the cases, a small number of French people of Jewish origin who have joined the Islamic State. So <clears throat> let me take this and bring this slightly closer to home. Take that kind of thinking and look at Singapore. For the Singapore case, are we so sure over the very long term that it's always going to be the same types of people who are going to be radicalized? So let me end some closing thoughts by precisely on that subject. Uh, and I want to introduce a, a grey swan, which I think is possibly the only animal which has not yet been, been introduced into the, the menagerie. I want to give you an example of a grey swan. March uh, 2016. The arrest is announced of uh, an individual in Singapore. He's Singaporean, uh, Chinese origin. Uh, parents are actually from China, so he's a naturalized citizen. Some suggestion that he's sort of alienated, not fitting in. He's arrested with his bags packed, as far as we know, about to go to either Syria or Iraq to fight for Kurdish militia against Islamic State. Now, now we know very little about this individual, but from what we know, he was influenced by media reports, IS, the atrocities, the genocide of the, of the Kurds, of others. So he feels he has to do something. And of course, there are push factors as well. He has a failed uh, business venture in Singapore, uh, which is surprisingly common when you study these, these kinds of people, push factors. And I think the French have this word, anomie, it's a wonderful word, which describes this kind of rootlessness or, or, or aimlessness. So, and by the way, there are numbers of French people doing this too, lone wolves fighting, fighting ISIS. We can come to that later. So you have this person, he was detained. Worldwide, we were interested enough after this case to make a, a special study, and I think the biggest database available on these people, 
of these kinds of anti-IS fighters. So the number is in the high hundreds, possibly under 1,000. Following the Singapore case, we studied these people based on what they say on, on, on Facebook, social media, Twitter. Some are alienated, some are very rational, some want to find meaning. Some are deeply ideological, some are socialists, Marxists, they believe in the Kurdish, the Ocalan uh, Marxist creed. Some are anarchists. Some see this as a Manichaean, good versus evil struggle. A few simply want to kill Muslims. A few want to get away from their wives, so that, that's a separate issue. <laughs> it, it's also possible <clears throat> to see some of them, like the Singaporean, as wanting to escape from other kinds of personal issues. But there's a clear subset of these people I've just described who, after a fashion, in their own way, are, are clearly uh, radicalized. So I said I had one slide. Can I get that slide? Possible to get that slide? No, not that one. <laughs> ah. So I, pretend, I presented before a, a, closed, a closed audience of uh, security types uh, on the phenomenon of these anti-IS. We call them reverse jihad uh, fighters. We took um, their social media, these are actual social media posts where they described themselves and why they had what they, they had to do, but we couldn't make it easy. So I've interspersed um, social media posts of uh, people who also joined Nusra and uh, Islamic State. This is actually uh, what they say. You will see, you can have your hand at trying to guess who is who, but you will see that a few are dead giveaways. It's actually really obvious. We put those in as a taster, but some are considerably more difficult. And even as I talk, I'll continue talking, see whether you can make out who's the anti-IS fighter and who is the, the Islamic State uh, fighter. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and by the way, the first generation of Islamic State fighters who went in roughly 2012, they'll be very offended if you call them terrorists. They, like the Singaporean chap, see themselves as humanitarian. They saw Assad killing his own people, genocide. They had to do something. That's true, many of them later got co-opted into Nusra or Islamic State, but that's a separate issue. They had to do something. So this do something, even as you look at the slide, I have to ask, what next? Are there going to be Buddhists, and those of you new to Singapore will know that there are many Buddhists in the region, as Kishore said, and many in, in Singapore as well. Are there going to be Buddhists wanting to get off the couch? And by the way, the, 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 the number of times the phrase get off the couch appears in the motivating factors of these guys is really surprising. Get off the couch and take an active part in the conflict going on in Rakhine State. Isn't that possible? Which, of course, jihadist social media is painting as Buddhist oppression of the Rohingya, fueled by, fueled by ideologue Buddhist monks. So there was some mention yesterday of anarchists, and I should mention to you, some of you might know this, in March 2017, quite recently, a letter bomb sent uh, to the IMF office in Paris. It was not ISIS. It was Greek anarchists. And guess what? Greek anarchists are very represented in the group of IS anti-IS fighters that I'm talking about. So take all this thinking and ask yourself, what next? If all these kinds of new kinds of people are being radicalized, what next? So I was discussing with uh, a couple of speakers yesterday, and I wanted to put this in. Every time I try saying this, I get laughed at, so I want to see who laughs at me. Look at all these people thrown out of work by uh, technology, for example. Um, of course, we've had discussions over the past 24 hours how much is the impact, how many, but look at them thrown out of work. For how long are they going to be simply content driving your Uber, coming in to fix your Wi-Fi? For how long are they going to be content or are they going to nurse their resentment to a certain pitch? I'm not for a moment, of course, suggesting that you stop taking Uber or stop getting people into your home to fix your, your Wi-Fi, but what I am trying to posit is that we live in a future where all kinds of people are, are going to be radicalized. So there's an Australian academic called Greg Barton, who is a very shrewd and astute observer on the radicalization stakes and on Southeast Asia. And he said in 2011, I quote, I wouldn't be surprised if in 30 years time, we have people involved in violent attacks on say, dam sites, power stations, in the name of protecting the environment, perhaps in a time when the environmental crisis have got much worse, end quote. So in closing, I'll be willing to make the observation that from now until the next IRS, in just under two years. From now until then, what we will have is not just weak signals. We have those now. We will have noteworthy attacks I'll be willing to wager by people, anarchists, environmental types, people who believe in causes, people who believe in certain creeds, other than the Islamists. And in saying this, I'm not trying to be politically correct. I'm trying to be correct. Thank you very much. <laughs>